Hello. Hi, everyone. My name is John Gutierrez. I'm the director of the Center for Latin American, Caribbean, and Latino Studies here at the CUNY Graduate Center. I'm very happy to welcome you uh, to this afternoon's panel discussion on Puerto Rican New York, uh, which marks the launch of our most recent Latino Data Project publication titled The Puerto Rican Population of the New York Metropolitan Region, 1970-2020. This report, uh, which can be downloaded directly from the center's website, everyone should have one of these cool cards. There's a QR code where you can download the report directly. Um, this report, um, which you'll hear more about uh, from its author in, in a few minutes, uh, focuses on, sorry, <laughs> uh, focuses on the changes in the Puerto Rican communities of the New York City metropolitan area. These changes uh, provide an opportunity to reflect on the past, present, and future of the Puerto Rican community. And to do that, uh, we are lucky to count on three insightful and remarkable women who have agreed to join us this afternoon. Lorraine Cortez Vasquez, who is not here just yet, but will be soon, uh, soon enough, uh, is a lifelong New Yorker and civic leader who currently serves as the commissioner of the New York City Department for the Aging and is a trustee and graduate of the City University of New York. Uh, Yarimar Bonilla is the interim director of the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College. She's an anthropologist and a member of the anthropology faculty here at the Graduate Center who has published extensively on Puerto Rico, including co-editing with Marisol Lebron, Aftershocks of Disaster, Puerto Rico Before and After the Storm 2019. Finally, Claudia Irizarri Aponte is a native of Puerto Rico and a writer for the city newspaper where she covers labor issues in New York City. Her reporting with Josefa Velasquez on the emerging organizing efforts of New York City app-based delivery workers led to First in Nation local legal protections for those workers. Together, they were awarded a National Edward R. Murrow Award for Feature Reporting and the James Beard Award for Investigative Reporting, among other honors. She is also a graduate of the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. We'll be hearing from our guest in, in a few minutes, uh, but first, um, we tend to give thanks uh, to staff at the end of events like this when people are tired and they're ready to head home. I want to change that tradition uh, a little bit uh, by expressing my gratitude to the wonderful men and women who make the center run and make events like these possible, including Andreina Torres Sangarita, Lidia Hernandez Tapia, Sebastián Villamizar Santa Maria, Kathy Cabrera Figueroa, Diomel Carriz, and especially my partner in crime, Mila Burns. Secondly, um, I want to welcome our provost here at the Graduate Center, Steve Everett, uh, who has been a very big supporter of our work at the center uh, and regularly shows up at our events, which we know is not very easy, easy for a provost to do. Um, so we're going to ask him to just come up and say a couple of words of welcome uh, to, uh, to you all before we uh, get started. Steve. Thank you, John. Yes, I, I think this center has sort of worn out my evening schedule for the most part because they do so many great things. And I, every time I go to one, I think this, you know, th this is the best urban university in the world, as we all know. And I think this center perhaps captures the essence of that urban university probably more than any other activity we do at, at the Grand Center. So I always love to sort of see the kind of communities that they bring. I think the last event was the uh, music event where the, the <coughs> featuring the music of uh, Sergio Assad, a famous uh, Brazilian guitarist. You know, they had the Brazilian uh, consulate was there. There were just so many great things. Every single time I go to one of these center events, it just makes me feel this is what the Grad Center really is all about. Um, many of you know the center, but you know I learned when I came here a year ago about the history of the center. And of course, Laird starting this, the founding director of it in 2001. Uh, when you look at the number of events that have taken place over the center, it's just remarkable. I mean, the center is really here to attract try to attract more Latino students to the PhD program, which they've been very successful at doing. They also do fundraising, they do uh, interdisciplinary programming for, for the students, but also which we're featuring tonight, I think one of the most exciting projects is how they really looked at the population of New York and really have been a way to dive into that in understanding of the populations of New York. How do they, how have they grown? How have they struggled? Uh, understanding that that's really uh, in some ways getting at the heart of how we understand the human experience at the Grad Center. And I think this center is, is one of the most important ones at the center that, that I've discovered in being here. So thank you for all the invitations and, and I look forward to this uh, panel discussion with very distinguished guests tonight. So thank you all.
Thanks, Steve. Um, we appreciate you, you you taking the time to be with us this afternoon. Um, so, uh, in order uh, to set the table for our guests today, I want to invite the center's executive director, Professor Laird Bergad, uh, to join us here and walk us through some of the key findings of this most recent Latino Data Project report. Uh, you may have heard, um, and if you haven't, you will now, uh, that the center has now published more than 100 reports since the creation of the Latino Data Project. Most of those reports are the product of Laird's diligent work and commitment to using data to tell stories that influence policy discussions and drive conversations like the one we're going to have tonight. We'll have an opportunity for questions at the end of the session this afternoon, so I would ask you to hold off with your questions for Laird until then. In the meantime, let me introduce uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Laird Bergat. Thank you very much, John. Um, I'm going to show you, a, I wrote a very long report, uh, which is available on the internet uh, for downloading. Uh, I'm going to show you some numbers. Most people yawn when they hear numbers, yawn when they see numbers. They say, what are these numbers? This is all sterile statistics. What's important about data is not the data. It's the story that the data tells. These numbers are not sterile numbers, they tell a story. And so you have to transcend the sterility of numbers and look at what the story that's being told. Now, I've studied the New York metropolitan area, not just New York City. And the reason primarily is because there has been a huge demographic transformation within the Puerto Rican community in the area and the process of suburbanization has uh, taken over. These data reveal that process very clearly. The apex of the Puerto Rican population in New York City was 1970. The Puerto Rican population of the city has declined ever since steadily, but in the surrounding counties, as you can see by this graph, the population has grown. So there's been a process of suburbanization that is quite clear. Although the Dominican population surpassed Puerto Ricans in the city, Somewhere around 2014, 2015, the Puerto Rican population of the metropolitan area is still larger than the Dominican population because of this process of suburbanization. Okay. Now, you can see here, uh, again, um, where are we here? Back, back, what is back, back, back. Uh, we can follow here what is implicitly the process of natural reproduction, which is normal to any kind of immigrant group. Uh, those born in the United States by 2020, and this little graphic is covering that uh, statistic, comprise 77% of the Puerto Rican population in the New York metropolitan area. Island-born Puerto Ricans, 23% as of 1920. You can see the trajectory here. What is quite interesting here is that nearly 90% of all Puerto Ricans under 50 years of age were born in the United States and not on the island. And I, I think that that is something significant that you all want to discuss, the impl political implications and other implications of that. Um, astoundingly, the Census Bureau reported that 45% of this under 50-year-old population spoke only English. I'll leave that to you to dissect and digest. This reflects the process of suburbanization and the overall decline in the percentage of all Puerto Ricans in the region who lived in the city. Ron from a high of 83% down to 56%. Again, the numbers, meaningful. The story, more meaningful. Here we have, where do Puerto Ricans live? We can see the growth of the New Jersey suburbs. Uh, that were indicated in the map that I showed you before, uh, a continual growth of people living in the New Jersey, New Jersey suburbs, also in the northern New York su suburbs and uh, Fairfield County, Connecticut, which is, of course, where Bridgeport is, which is a major center of Puerto Rican settlement, uh, to a lesser extent, Long Island. Uh, we can look here. This is a very interesting graph. Because when we associate the Puerto Rican population in New York City, we always think of El Barrio, no? Uh, in fact, of the matter is that going back to 1970, more Puerto Ricans lived in the Bronx than lived in Manhattan and El Barrio. 
So you can see this, uh, the settlement patterns uh, are very clear here. Uh, Brooklyn, Bronx, Manhattan, the major areas of settlement. Manhattan, less Puerto Ricans, fewer Puerto Ricans than we find in the Bronx or Brooklyn. Households, extraordinary transformation is taking place. First of all, as to be expected because of demographic change, Puerto Rican households, uh, US born Puerto Ricans had more households than island born Puerto Ricans. But what is most interesting is the following graph, the role of women in Puerto Rican, among the Puerto Rican population. That as of 2020, the census data indicate that over 60% of all Puerto Rican households are headed by women. That is very, very, very significant cultural transformation from what took place back in 1970. Uh, we look at um, income. It's not surprising that US born Puerto Rican households had higher incomes than Puerto Rican born US, uh, Puerto Rican born uh, households. Uh, very significant differentiation, and that's in all likelihood related to greater levels of educational attainment. However, when we look at the differentiation in median household incomes between the male-headed households and female-headed households, we see a very clear disequilibrium. 60% of all Puerto Rican households may have been headed by women, but they earn significantly less than men. Wage discrimination, uh, discrimination in all the workplaces, uh, this is something that should be uh, examined in more detail because Puerto Rican women have higher educational attainment levels than Puerto Rican men. All right. If we look at college graduation rates, clear progress. What's not being stated here, and it's very unfortunate, is that among all of Lat the major Latino national subgroups in New York City, Dominicans, Mexicans, Ecuadorians, Colombians, Puerto Ricans have the lowest college graduation rate, comparatively speaking. There have been progress. Here we see the differentiation between men and women. Look at, look at 2020. 20% of adult Puerto Rican women graduated college compared to 15% of Puerto Rican men. Why is there such a great differential in median household incomes if educational attainment levels are higher for Puerto Rican women? Um, this shows you the differential of income and uh, uh, household income uh, between Puerto Ricans born in the United States, Puerto Rican, uh, Puerto Ricans. Oh, no, excuse me. Well, this is this is the uh, uh, college graduation rate. So you can see that there's a much higher college graduation rate among uh, Puerto Ricans born in the US. Um, we also see that the suburbs, and this shouldn't be surprising, have higher college graduation rates than the city. <laughs> Uh, New York State suburban county is the highest, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's it. Uh, the report is very long. There are many more numbers. If you're curious about them, you can certainly make inquiries to me, to John, to the center. I turn this back over to my friend, John Gutierrez. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Larry. So um, we're going to switch over to these, uh, I think, very comfortable chairs, or I hope very comfortable chairs, uh, with our panelists. Laird, you should, you should join us here. Uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about this report and then field your questions, uh, which I'm sure you have. So, so as, as we saw, um, there's obviously so much more uh, in this report. Um, when, when Laird sent this to me um, over the summer, um, you know, those of us who've worked with Laird for a very long time know that he publishes, um, you know, his research and he wants to get it out the door very quickly. Um, and a couple of minutes into reading the report, I said, hold on a second. Um, there's something, there's something big here, right? Um, because for me, the, one of the key findings here um, is that there has been this remarkable demographic transition in the Puerto Rican population in, in the New York metro area. And one of the things that I think the report does well is to chronicle the ways in which that transition has, has taken place. Um, when you all saw, and I shared the report with you all um, beforehand, what were your, I wanna start at the sort of 30,000 foot level. Um, what were your initial 
initial reactions to to what you uh, to what you saw. So I, I'll open it up to I you know whichever one of the three of you, Lorraine. I don't know if you want to get us started. Your general impressions of of what you saw in the report, what jumped out at you? First of all, thank you for doing it. Um, it's been a long time since we've seen a study on Puerto Ricanos and Puerto Ricanos in New York, and this wide array of data on Puerto Ricanos. I'm sure you're going to tell me differently, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but I I was very fascinated by the data. Not, nothing in the report surprised me except one data point, which was the influence of New Jersey. I was totally surprised. Long Island didn't surprise me, Connecticut, Northern New York, you know, the broader New York regional area. But I was really struck by um, the amount of out migration to, to New Jersey and the distinctions um, in the educational and the income status. I was very surprised by that. So that was like the only data source that right. surprised me. And then I had a, the question that it raised for me is when you were talking about Puerto Rican born versus US born, it was what generation, all right? Were these the parents or these are the parents of the young ones who were then born here? Are these new migrants? And so looking at the data and not having that bit of information, something stood out as they didn't make sense to me. So knowing that data, I think, would have reconciled some of the other data sources and the comparisons. Um, but that was it. I just thank you for doing this. We need, I wish you would have done more on the- um, Oh, please elect don't tell him that. Huh? Don't tell him that. <laughs> of course, <laughs> course I'm going to tell more. him that. I wish you would have done more on the political participation, civic engagement. Uh, because there's a difference between civic engagement and political participation. And that would have been a good contrast, because I think we're more civically engaged than we probably, obviously, by the data that right. we participated in the electoral process. Um, so those are the things okay. that I would. Great. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, sure. um, thanks again for having me here, and thanks, Laird, for doing this. Um, this incredibly just broad um, study and, and scope and, and reach. I was really struck by, um, struck by and yet not surprised by um, the fact that 90% of self-identifying Puerto Ricans were born in the US rather than in Puerto Rico. Not surprised because I am part of that brain drain generation at this point probably in the second and third generation of Puerto Ricans who were educated in Puerto Rico as a state university in Puerto Rico and then betrayed the island by moving on and becoming taxpayers elsewhere in the continental US. Um, but it does demonstrate that New York is becoming um, less of a desirable destination or even first jump for a lot of working class families in Puerto Rico that are seeking to leave the island. This is a trend that we've, at least me anecdotally, you've seen for at least 20 years now where most people go to Florida first or they go to Texas or they go to Pennsylvania. Um, and that speaks to larger issues about, you know, and these are people who are looking for working class jobs. Um, and to provide for for their families and to become homeowners, which is unfortunately, you know, and again, that number speaks to the reality here that we've seen in New York, where it's become more difficult to have that upward mobility to find blue collar work to become to achieve home ownership opportunities that um, even other populations in New York have sought elsewhere. Right. And, and those jobs obviously were the things that drove Puerto Ricans in the first place to come to the city and their disappearance right has a has a he heavy weight. Right, on Puerto Ricans not, not coming here as much anymore. Yarimar. Yeah, can you Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to go last because I want to kick it back to Laird, actually, because when you started your presentation, you said, okay, don't let your eyes glaze over on these numbers. It's about the story. And I agree, I mean, I'm not a data person, I'm an anthropologist, so I'm all about the story. And I guess what was not clear to me was what was the story you wanted to tell with these numbers and what are the policy implications to your in your mind uh, to these findings. Um, for me, m I, honestly, my reaction was to ask what is the story it was not it was not clear to me it did not jump out to me like what the implication was. Um, and 
to my mind also, it's still like New York City is still the city with the most Puerto Ricans in the United States. Um, the Bronx is, and, and Kings County are still the counties with the most Puerto Ricans across the United States. Um, and, and beyond numbers, because again, I'm not a numbers person, I think the impact that Puerto Ricans have had into the cultural fabric of New York City is undeniable. The institutions that we have founded, the civic participation, which is again, another question that I had with all these numbers is also like, what are we comparing them to? Because, you know, Puerto Ricans, we get grouped with Latinos, but what do we have in common with Salvadorians, you know, in terms of our, what brings us to the United States, our push and pull factors, uh, the way we integrate or not into the political institutions and fabric of, of the city and, and to other Latino groups. You know, I always have to remind folks, Puerto Ricans are not immigrants. Um, we are colonial subjects. We have a particular history, a particular relationship to the US and that, that also guides our political participation and our civic participation. Um, in the US and we have been doing, um, we have a report that's coming out at Centro looking at displacement among Puerto Ricans and the levels of the, the shockingly low levels of home ownership among Puerto Ricans in New York State, um, like, like wildly disproportionate to any other group. And I think that's something that, you know, I'm always like, to me, numbers don't explain, they need to be explained. So why is that happening? Why is it that Puerto Ricans have no kind of foothold in the city? And to what extent does that influence their displacement into the suburbs in other places? How rooted is that in the fact that Puerto Ricans have been in all the kind of hot pockets of gentrification? Like I, I'm a newcomer to New York and everywhere I go in New York, uh, first I see like Luis Munoz Marin Boulevard or something like randomly out of place in Williamsburg or something. And everywhere I go, people are like, oh, this used to be super Puerto Rican. Every, it feels like every corner of New York used to be super right. Puerto Rican, Chelsea, Williamsburg, Sunset Park, um, everywhere I go, right? So why is it that those like, you know, those neighborhoods, why are Puerto Ricans no longer there? You know, I don't think it is because of a desire to leave the city, but rather what kind of forces are particularly targeting Puerto Ricans. And I also think that um, because of our colonial migration, there's an invest, a different kind of investment in the motherland or in, you know, la patria, however you want to call it. Um, that I don't know to what extent it guides uh, the lack of home ownership, the lack of really throwing roots and anchors in the city, in a city where you really need to grab a hold of it before you get pushed out, right? Because so many folks leave with the constant idea of return. Um, and so and those are just some of the questions that, that I was asking myself. Those are there are a lot of questions. Lorraine wants to jump in here. Go ahead. Yeah, um, two things, Lair. Had we had data pre-1970, a lot of those stories and a lot of those questions could be answered, right? Because the population between 1921, when we started coming, to 1970 is vastly different and encountered many, many things and informed uh, what happened from 1970 to to, uh, to 2022 and has informed. And then we had policies that literally, uh, and, and practices that literally kept us out mm -hmm. of this economic opportunity called mm -hmm. home ownership. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, uh, we, were not, we were very entrepreneurial, if you look at pre-1970, but we didn't retain that. Like other groups come and they grow the business and then it goes into something else. We were great bodegueros mm -hmm. and great fishmongers and mm -hmm. you know great entrepreneurs, but then we did not pass that on. So it wasn't generational. Uh, it was to the extent that we then moved to the suburbs. That was the dream. Make your business and then move your children you know, to Rockland and Westchester, to right. and to Duchess and to out, outside of New York, even outside of the Bronx. What was interesting, if you do the pre-70, you will see that those populations suffered discrimination far worse than their parents may have in mm -hmm. their youth in New York. Because mm -hmm. that's how Aspida started across mm -hmm. New York State. Mm -hmm. Because when they moved to Rockland, and they moved, you know, like right outside <clears throat> Amsterdam. 
they were basically said need not apply you don't belong here and so what they went for the bet for the greater dream they were really rejected so sometimes your generation experienced harsher discrimination the only thing that they didn't experience <clears throat> was the continuous poor education you didn't go to a poor elementary school to a poor middle school to a poor high school so at least you had some kind of educational footing that helped you combat some of that discrimination that you experienced. But there is a story there <clears throat> that really informs what we're what what your data is showing. I, I just want to give Laird a chance to to respond here because part part of the reason why we we wanted to bring you all together is because we wanted your help in crafting the story, right? Um, because you know we have the Latino Data Project and we do this work. Um, but there's a there's an enormous amount of expertise and lived experience within the Puerto Rican community that we think is essential to helping us create a narrative around around the numbers. That being said, I do want to give you a chance to you know uh, you know chime in here. Yeah. Uh, first of all, the story between 1921 and 1960 is quite fascinating. If I told that, the numbers would be dizzying. People would leave before I finished. I'm actually writing a book on the history of Latinos in the New York metropolitan area, and I do have all the data from actually 1900 all the way up to 1960. So I think that you're absolutely right. It's a different story. It's a different history. It's a when you have a immigrant population that is born in country of origin that predominates, that's a very different history than a population which is uh, increasingly born here in the United States. So uh, I think that's one thing. Um, is with respect to policy and the political impact of that, that's that's not my ballywick. I, I don't go into that, whether I'm a social demographic and economic historian, and I do look at politics. Uh, you'll notice that at the end of the report, I talk a little bit about the Puerto Rican electorate. That is not people who vote, that is people who are eligible to vote. And still to this day, despite the, the fact that there are more Dominicans in the city, the Puerto Rican Potential voting population is the largest of all the Latino national subgroups in the city and in the metropolitan area. So it's up to you who deal with politics. Uh, as far as what the story is, the story is the transformation of an immigrant community. An immigrant community that looked one way in 1940, looked another way in 1950, looked another way in 1980, looked another way in uh, 2020. Um, I certainly, appreciate the whole issue of colonialism. In fact, Cesar Ayala and I just wrote a book that was published two years ago uh, on early Puerto Rican history, uh, looking at this whole economic impact of the United States. Okay, But colonialism means one thing at one particular period of time to one particular generation. It means something else to another generation. It's very hard to craft the colonial narrative among a population that was born here predominantly. And if you look at the population, young people, it's not for me to answer this question, what kinds of ties and what kinds of memories do they have to this colonial enterprise, which I certainly don't dispute under any circumstances. I think that's the difference of generational change. You know, people have different attitudes and whether it's political, whether it's cultural, whatever it may be. Ali, I, I want you to jump in here because we're talking about this generational difference, right, over time uh, and the perception of, uh, I guess I'm curious what the perception of New York is from the perspective of the islands, right? Because traditionally coming here was, like you said, it was the jump off point mm -hmm. for, integration into the into the mainland you know the bueno del kikirigi that that kind of stuff you know i wonder from your perspective how how you see and how your generation in puerto rico sees the new york that has been described here is this like ancient history to you uh or is this very is there some other framing uh to think yeah. about the city in the puerto rican imaginary that's an enormous question and i think Sorry. a lot of people <laughs> will have different responses um you know like i was 
born and raised in Puerto Rico in the 90s and early 2000s. So it's a very different generation from people who grew up in the 70s and sure. 80s and, and, and beyond that. Um, but I think that, again, the cultural capital and the cultural impact, that dialogue between Puerto Rico and New York is completely undeniable. Um, the, like I grew up reading children's storybooks about El Barrio and everyone knows, you know, you, you, go, you come to New York City, you visit New York City, everyone has at least one relative in New York, however many generations removed. But I really do believe, again, for, for my generation in, in Puerto Rico and people within my age group, that the relationship is fading. You have more relatives in other areas of Puerto Rico, like Florida and Texas and Pennsylvania even. And for a lot of families and working families who are looking to leave Puerto Rico, and obviously that's not everybody, not everyone wants to leave Puerto Rico. So I, I you know, resist to kind of like latch on to that narrative, but less, but New York is becoming less and less that first gener that first destination or that first thought. So it is a relationship that's fading in some sense. Um, but I really do think that in terms of just cultural capital and that sentimentality and that relationship is there. And I don't think it'll ever quite fade away. Right. Um, yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm curious about this whole, f um, you mentioned the, the foothold business, right? That Puerto Ricans have a foothold in the city. We see it, Loisaida, El Barrio, Los Sures, right? We, we know these places based on their Puerto Ricanness. And I'm wondering whether or not we can, we can have a Puerto Rican New York that doesn't have a lot of Puerto Ricans, right? Like, does it become so embedded in the DNA of the city that the presence of large numbers of Puerto Ricans isn't necessarily a condition of the existence of that, that sabor, that flavor, that Puerto Rican flavor? That's, that's scary to me because I think, yeah. <laughs> I think it's also a question that people are asking about Puerto Rico itself. itself correct. Uh, there is this fear of the desire of a Puerto Rico without Puerto Ricans right. and of Puerto Ricans just being a kind of like the Tainos, a kind of cultural, yeah, you, right. know, yeah. uh, you know, grounding. Um, and is it, you know, when a lot of folks say that what they want for Puerto Rico, the kind of economic development experience by, in Hawaii, but if you go to Hawaii, you're like, where are the Hawaiians? You know, what does it even mean to be Hawaiian and, and at this moment, right? Um, so I think those questions are very present. And, and again, I, I think I really want us to consider that the fact that Puerto Ricans have moved to the suburbs might not be entirely rooted in a desire to to move out there I'm, I, or, or that that desire might be conditioned by the inability to stay where they are. Right. Um, so in the face of what is available to you to live in the city, what can you afford, what kind of programs are, exist, and this is the policy question, right? Uh, what what it will, what does you know what policy questions should emerge from this report is how can we uh, allow Puerto Ricans to move to the suburb only through choice like if they shouldn't feel pushed out like if they want to leave they're great and okay if the, if what we're seeing is that Puerto Ricans want to live in the suburb well let's make sure that these don't become sites of greater uh, discrimination and hardship for them right but if they don't want to move to the suburbs, just like many Puerto Ricans don't want to leave Puerto Rico, right? Uh, it's not just that not all Puerto Ricans, it's that most Puerto Ricans don't. And if you if you listen to the kind of cultural landscape in Puerto Rico right now, what you hear everywhere is a, a desire to stay, uh, a, a kind of the idea of staying as an act of political resistance against all these forces that are pushing folks out. Right. And, and again, the question of colonialism, I want to insist that this is, it's not about a memory of colonialism. Colonialism is being lived every day in Puerto Rico right now, you know, and, and increasingly so uh, since the uh, economic crisis in Puerto Rico, colonialism has been hardened. It's become more apparent. It's talked about more overtly. Mm -hmm. um, there was a time where to talk about colonialism meant that you were leftist, right. pro-independent, right. FBI would open a, a case against you, you'd right. be surveilled, you'd have a carpeta. Like now everyone's talking about colonialism because it's become so in your face with the uh, oversight board with the treatment of Puerto Ricans after Hurricane Maria, um, you know, there's been more of an awareness also in the in the U.S. mainstream, uh, you know, conversation. 
about this colonial relationship, right? So I think that that's something that is, is still guiding very much current generations of Puerto Ricans. Jenny, and you brought up, sorry to no, cut no, you off, no, no, and you brought up an excellent point earlier that is something that I've thought of a lot as someone who's only lived in New York for the last five years, and it's the fact that the Puerto Rican communities, the iconic Puerto Rican communities, El Barrio, Luis Saida, Williamsburg, are fading. So for a lot of Puerto Ricans who are maybe looking to leave the island, they feel like they don't really have a home or a community that is known to them here in New York City, and I think that's also part of the uh, of the conversation as well. Right. Right, where to go? So, I mean, I, exactly. That's that's such a scary question. Yeah. For me. I mean, it really right. is. But there is something that you cannot erase, and you cannot erase history, and you cannot erase iconic institutions, <laughs> and you cannot. Erase, so even though it's no longer La Cuna, um, and no longer is it affordable if you are going to be a new entrant to New York, unless you are migrating here um, for other reasons that this is the only place you can go uh, or they send you to um, the but i also believe in our iconic institutions i believe in our history and i think that gives you we will not disappear we our forces may be diminished but our history and our impact on this city will never be lost and i don't think it's lost by anyone who lives in in puerto rico either Everyone knows that this was La Cuna, um, and it still happens to be uh, the sixth borough of, of, of Puerto Rico. <laughs> I mean, Puerto Rico is the sixth borough. But what we can't lose sight of is, is and this is to, to Lair's data, the fact that we were talking about the largest number of Puerto Ricans live in the Bronx, and yet when we started looking at unemployment rates, that nationally the unemployment rate is about what 3.6 mm -hmm. alabama is 2.7 or something like that and the bronx is seven point something that in itself tells you the story of the puerto Rican yeah. in new york right the other thing that it tells you is when you look at the aging population is if i looked at that timeline that you yep. had mm -hmm. there is a whole factor of aging in puerto Rican, mm -hmm. right and if you look at our poverty level based on your data, it is alarming. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that is that's a, a a call, you know, for action on everyone's part, you know, the city, but also for Puerto Ricanos. When uh, what was it, thirty percent of our population? It was between twenty five and twenty nine point something percent over the age of fifty live in poverty. That's staggering, and that requires a whole revision of policies and and legacy here so the people that will carry that tradition or right. that are our storytellers and that who we should be getting that story from are living in such dire conditions it is something that is is quite frightening and yep. and that's why i don't believe it, it'll be lost i just think that it keeps getting battered um and beaten you know and i think of freddie's election in nine in 97 his last attempt i think that was the beginning of the last blow of the beating you know in terms of our our power and our influence and and we've just and we see it in all of the data today and we see it in the in the lack of leadership i'm gonna say i want to i want to talk about the lack of leadership in a second um but i there, there's something that you mentioned, Yadimar, about these connection, the the presence of colonialism. One of the things that I've noticed, just to transition to the question of political mobilization, is that I, I remember growing up. I, I grew up in in New Jersey, um, you know, so take it with a grain of salt. Uh, but I grew up in a city that was very, very Puerto Rican, which was Newark, and I I never remember any significant political mobilization among Puerto Ricans in my city around issues on the island. And I think something fascinating has happened mm -hmm. in the last 10 or so years, which is that I see young Puerto Ricans, beginning with the Ricky Renuncia, continuing with Promesa, now with Fuera Luma, mm -hmm. you, I see many more young Puerto Ricans stateside who are engaged in the politics of the island in a way that maybe their parents or grandparents' generation was not. And I wonder whether or not that 
in your mind sort of will help to um, strengthen the connections that exist between the stateside Puerto Rican community and, and the island? Yes, and I mean, it's just such a different time too in terms of connection. I mean, I'm always, you know, since there's turning 50, and so I talk to a lot of folks yeah. about its founding, and I'm always so like moved, but also like devastated to think about how 50 years ago activists they had to go to Puerto Rico and like search for materials and bring back a maleta full of pamphlets and books and stuff. And then you know some of them didn't Spanish wasn't their first language anymore, and so how to deal with all that? There was just like a a, a need for for resources about our community, which is why Centro was created. But now, um, you know, it's so much easier to to get information, to stay in touch, to be in contact. Tomorrow we have an event at Centro with this uh, TikToker YouTuber <laughs> um, Bianca Grolo, who who has yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah, she yeah. she Wonderful, did the yeah. documentary piece of the Bad Bunny video, um, and. I just, I, I love her. She's such, I, I think she's such a great story of someone who went back to Puerto Rico in its moment of crisis to help her family. And she had an emerging career in traditional media in, in the US. And she's like, you know what? I don't wanna do this. I wanna do my own thing. And just started using TikTok and all these other social media forms, which we're so quick to talk about all their negative aspects and they're dumbing us down or whatever people like to say about social media, but they're also, you know, I always say so any any media is, is a tool, you know, sure. and it can be political or it can be repressive. It's what you do with it. And so I've talked to so many folks in the diaspora who have felt more connected to what's going on in Puerto Rico because of mm. folks like her who are doing things in English, because that's the thing. There was always a disconnect between what was happening in Puerto Rico in Spanish and what's happening in the US in English. And so she does a lot of her videos in English, but they also go viral in Puerto Rico because for good or for bad, there's more, uh, the English language is, has penetrated more in Puerto Rico with globalization, the internet, uh, social media, streaming, everything. That's colonialism. Colonial, <laughs> but, but you know, but colonialism has been a constant, know, know, but English has yeah. never penetrated quite, like my grandmother remembers English, um, English speaking gringo teachers arriving in Puerto right. Rico yeah. and trying to implement like English only learning and it just never worked but now i think with the internet of globalization cable tv like i remember in puerto rico growing up with three channels in spanish and that was it you know and so that's not what life is like anymore so i think those language barriers are broken down the geographic barriers are broken down because of social media and so many other forms of communication and it used to be that you know say iban palos no llore and you didn't really know what was happening to to the communities over there it took you know, communication wasn't as instant as it is now, whereas now I'm in the US watching the Bad Bunny concert at a Choliseo on a live stream. Like right. you, you stay connected in a different right. way. Right. And so I think uh, that, that you know, there, there's still those weird feelings about like, am I Puerto Rican enough if I was born here, if I don't speak Spanish? Mm -hmm. No, it's not like that hasn't it gone away. anywhere. Yeah, it yeah. It didn't just come out of the- Yeah, oh, no, no, absolutely. For sure. that, that was, was a policy, that, yeah. That was a policy and that was the colonialism that was imposed on the Puerto yep. Ricans from here. Yes. You know, right. where you were rejected over there, you're like, espérate, I'm not Puerto Rican enough there, and here I'm rejected for being Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. So that kind of dichotomy mm -hmm. is, yeah. and it's all part of colonialism, yeah. and you know, and the internalized oppression. All of that really keeps people from separating. I think one of the the feeling of of a of a, the diaspora's connection to Puerto Rico started because of some of the leadership. Uh, of, of New York, mm -hmm. who then became invested and it started, you know, a little bit pre Vieques, but mm -hmm. that was the right. beginning yeah. of, of an investment and an interest in Puerto Ricans educated born here for the mm -hmm. island, you know, other than, you know, being sent over there in the summers because you weren't behaving well. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it was a, it was a, it was changing. And I think that created a strong foundation for the Maria experience, you know, but th that was a gradual relationship that was developing between the diaspora yeah. and Puerto Rico, yeah. and which did not exist before, you know, like you said, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. you know? right. mm -hmm. and no one will hear from you 
again, unless you go right. out of your way. Unless to, you're right. retired and right. move back. You right. I, I will say one of, the, one of the interesting things about this returning to Puerto Rico is that I've also found young Puerto Ricans who have come here to the United States and have made the conscious decision to return to the island, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Like it's not the I'm the re I'm retiring. You know, I've worked you know in my job in New York forever. I saved my money. I built my little house. I returned to and no. These are young professional Puerto right. Ricans right. who have come here and they work as professionals and they are making a conscious decision to to return. And I think that that's Seems like it's an what interesting that mindset. There right. is the this, this mm -hmm. desire to create that my island and 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 build and reinforce right. my island right and i think yeah. that's and there, there's a whole movement of rematriation right. yeah, 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 the yeah, term yeah. they use yeah yeah, yeah. you were going to say yeah no I, I was just going to say that i think that um to that end like hurricane maria and the Ricky renuncia um uh you know um event just had a radicalizing effect right. um there's not no just question. on puerto ricans on the island but puerto ricans yeah. here and in other parts of the diaspora to really you know return to the island and to actually contribute to its future right and, and what was uh, i just wanted to add yeah. i'm sorry that was such a galvanizing between vieques mm -hmm. and and maria was such a galvanizing that it not only galvanized the diaspora to puerto rico but it galvanized the diaspora in the united states Absolutely. i mean because you had mm -hmm. if you had a cousin in philly or you might have had a a, mm -hmm. a, a distant cousin in, in lorraine ohio but what you didn't have, you know, was that connection of community across the United States with the strength that that those two those two incidences, those two factors really galvanized the uh, Puerto Rican community, which is why I think, you know, uh, Connecticut already has seen a Puerto Rican uh, mayor mm -hmm. and there'll be many more mm -hmm. in other places. We might not see one in New York, maybe mm -hmm. for another 10 years, mm -hmm. but. But you will, um, but you can see that kind of that kind of. We tried. Huh? We tried. Oh, we tried. We tried three times. <laughs> right. We tried. Um, so I, I want to. Uh, we could obviously go on yeah. just talking amongst ourselves, but I, I want to open this up to uh, to the audience for any thoughts or questions that you may have. I think we have a mic here, just so that we can record whatever questions you have. Um, but the the floor is open to um, to anyone and everyone. Or Andrena will be nice enough to carry the mic to people. Yeah, please use the mic. Hi, good evening, uh, Lear. Congratulations again. I think that this is an important report. I lo I do love the trajectory of you know the half century uh, of Puerto Ricans in, in New York. Uh, but I, I want to underscore two points that Lorraine has alluded to, and I think that are very important. Uh, one is about the age. It's not just the age cohort, but it's also the length of the Puerto Rican community in the United States, in the New York City area. And, you know, we, we alluded to the fact that we have been here since, you know, prior to uh, the turn of the 20th century. But as a community that arrived in droves post-World War II, we precede many of the other Latin American or Hispanic communities by at least one or two generations. And you can see that in that trend. Uh, uh, uh. And, and that also is manifested, I think, in terms of poverty, because the ones who were born in Puerto Rico and have been here in New York for a long period of time uh, tended to be of lower educational attainment. Uh, so, so, so you see that trajectory as well. And the second point is the fact that uh, um, beginning in 1970 uh, uh, is a starting point as any other, you know, as, as, as any, any other, but it comes in the heels of the civil rights movement. And I think that that opened up the doors that were closed in the suburbs for those Puerto Ricans who I wanted to and could afford to leave the city, go to the suburbs. And I don't think that that would have happened prior to the 1970s, or it was much more difficult for that to have happened. Um, so the fact that we can see that movement to the suburbs uh, on the one hand as a success of the civil rights movement you know we may want to take that into consideration uh and, and then finally is the fact that the success of the second and third generation of puerto ricans born and raised in the united states uh who decided with their skill set maybe we don't see that high level of educational attainment relative to other hispanic groups in new york city 
because those who have it among Puerto Ricans have taken it elsewhere. And the ones who remain don't have the same level. We, it would be interesting to see how other, you know, Dominicans and Mexicans or what have you who remain in the city, what are the niches that they have occupied to be able to translate that higher educational attainment, uh, whereas Puerto Ricans haven't been able to. Claire, do you want to respond? This is not a response, it's an observation here. Um, the Puerto Rican population of the metropolitan area is extremely complex. It's not heterogeneous. There is a very clear class structure uh, without question. If you look at income distribution patterns, for example, 30% of all Puerto Rican households have incomes above $100,000 per year. Now that's not chump change. They live lives that are very different from Puerto Ricans who are, as you mentioned, Lorraine, living in poverty. All right, I think that's one thing. We have to understand that this is a, it's very hard to cast general observations about a very complex community. Now the unifying factor is clearly nationality and, and identity, but it, it, this is not simple to understand. I would venture to say that the lives of someone living in who knows what county in New Jersey is very different from a Puerto Rican who lives in the Bronx. So I think you have to appreciate complexity. I think one more uh, comment that I want to make, and then I want to turn it over. Um, I study immigration, not just Puerto Rican immigration, not Cuban immigration, not Dominican immigration, but Scotch-Irish immigration in the 1860s and 1870s and Italian immigration in the 1890s and up to 1914, all right? And what we find, whether you want to wrap your head around this or not, is that the Puerto Rican population is following dynamics that are very typical of immigrant groups that have come to the United States. Now, I know the counter arguments that European immigrants were white, and that Latinos are discriminated against because of color. And I don't, don't deny that under any circumstances. But let me give you a piece of data that, and I could give you a hundred examples of this. All right. Puerto Rican women born in the United States, close to 40% marry non-Latinos. 40%. Now, that's huge when you think about what does that mean in terms of this overarching question of identity that people talk about. And what is a Puerto Rican, you see, if you're married to someone who is a non-Puerto Rican, all right? My wife, my ex-wife, happened to be Puerto Rican. Both of my children were born in Puerto Rico, okay? And so uh, how do they identify themselves? Very interesting question. I always ask my kids, you know, they were born on the island. They spoke Spanish before they spoke English. You know, how do you identify themselves? And you know what they ask, say to me? Depends on who I'm talking to. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm just throwing some of this stuff out of, of the complexity and the nuances that are much more important than overarching generalizations that don't hold up. Can I, can I, I do, think, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. No, no. I think you're right. I think the complexities are there. But I also think that you can't lose sight of the fact that migration patterns, right? If you are third generation New Yorker from and undereducated, your life pattern is going to be a lot different than if you were in New, New Jersey, if you were in, even even in Bridgeport, you know, and it, a lot of it has to do with educational uh, foundation. You know, you if you were if you were born in New York, educated in New York, the likelihood that you went, unless you lived in Staten Island, the likelihood that you went to a low performing school throughout your educational, mm -hmm. that has an impact, that has the long term impact. Those complexities um, have to be looked at, because migrating out of New York was a big determinant of your success. Mm -hmm. um, but if you stayed in New York, I mean, there are a few who were very fortunate, but if you stayed in New York and you did not get educated, the likelihood of a lifelong, and we see it now, 
lifelong poverty is there's no mystery to that you know and that's that's true of anyone but it was particularly true of puerto ricans who lived on in enclaves that were continuously disinvested in and and then you have the lifestyle and the outcome of a of a living in a community that was disinvested in until it was gentrified but you need to you those kind of differences also need to be looked at so i love your data about the the income and but it is from where did you come and where did you go right. and that makes a big big difference there i mean it's not you know those complexities are are quite different can i j just jump in just here? one one more yeah. quick sure. comment yeah yeah education Educational attainment is the key to social mobility. This is not nuclear rocket science. Now, if you look at page 55 on this report, <laughs> you're going to find a very interesting piece of data. 60% of all Puerto Rican women born in the United States have gone to college. 60%, not graduated. Thank you, City University of New York, because this is where they have gone to college, you see. And so, I think that's that that's that's extremely promising for the future. Mm -hmm. This this high percentage of people that are actually going to college, it's a very significant percentage of Puerto Rican men born here as well. Not as quite as high. And 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 City University has had to do so much remediation because of the poor education right. that they have. So I love the aspiration and I love the tenacity to pursue higher education. But you come into that process even at City University with lots of deficits. Right. And we see those all the time. Go ahead. I, I know we, we have a question in the back. Just okay. very quickly, I, I, I did, I'm sorry, Steve, go ahead. I just want to follow up. Obviously, I'm interested in the educational part of this question, because to me, it was really surprising that you have this higher attainment of education, but yet the poverty level doesn't seem to be following that exactly right. And I wanted to understand more the generational questions around what exactly is happening in the educational system. I mean, obviously, they're going to CUNY, but I know, give me an example. I was in Chicago for many years running an architecture school at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And it was it's surprising because all the architects that I met in Chicago, the older generation architects were primarily Polish. And what, what, what I was told is that many of the Polish families that immigrated to Chicago were construction workers. They were bricklayers, they were painters, and so forth. They were the, the building uh, immigrants of, of that early 20th century. The children of those people, when they went to college, they wanted to build buildings. They went into architecture. So today, most of the architects in New York are Polish. Looking at the younger, the students that I was teaching in architecture, they were primarily Mexican because Mexico City has really determined that they want to make architecture one of the big areas for Mexican training. So all of the young architects in Chicago and all the students were filled. I had my college was 45% Hispanic at the university we, because it was all Mexican architect students that were coming from Mexico City up to study there. I'm just wondering, does the Puerto Rico history of people going to college, is there a career option which is prevalent in any of the, the students that is then generating a sort of generational wealth that that is that, that you'd expect by that entertainment not just college per se but in particular skill sets that are giving them empowerment of the next generation because that's what i found in chicago with these intentional kind of ways that there were certain not just college but a certain degrees that were opening the door for it. today most of the urban planners in chicago are still polish so a very interesting kind of history of that i just wonder if there's any correlation that you've seen of, of that particular fields of education well L lorraine actually said it she said it quietly um but the social work profession um, in New York um, is an interesting example of, um, I, I was um, making my way through Sonia Sonia Lee's book about the building of a Latino civil rights movement. And she talks about the fact that when large numbers of Puerto Ricans came to the city, the city actually created an exemption from uh, requirements for social workers, for Puerto Rican women in particular, because there was such a dearth of social workers who were bilingual and who could, who were bilingual and bicultural, right? And so she uses Antonia Pantoja as one of her, one of her examples. So I think that there is, um, I don't know if it's a family business, right? Uh, like the bricklayers, um, but there are particular fields where that 
where the, you, you see an overrepresentation of that. Other right. than manufacturing, there wasn't an industry that Puerto Ricans had or or Bordelleros, right? So there was no industry that Puerto Ricans uh, participated in in large numbers, other than the skilled or unskilled type of work. What we did have was exposure, given the circumstances, to this cadre of nonprofits mm -hmm. and to this whole world of civic engagement. And if you look at Puerto Rican leadership mm -hmm. and you look at Puerto Rican electoral leadership, you know, in the black community, it comes strictly from the church, right? And that's where the leadership emerged. In the Puerto Rican community, it emerges from the nonprofit sector and from this from civic engagement that is that was the industry in which we would flourish and we also felt that we could make some changes in the community um that you did you did not have the opportunity to do elsewhere and we weren't sitting around the table with our uncle the lawyer or our cousin the professor or mm -hmm. our, our, <clears throat> our brother the doctor those were experiences were foreign to us and for a New York second generation born Puerto Rican, I still was struck when I would go to Puerto Rico and I would meet un juez or un, 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 un profesor. And it was like, mm -hmm. you're Puerto Rican. And my cousins would say, mira, mensa. So if you were here, mm -hmm. you did not have that mm -hmm. experience. So the only thing you had was the social worker mm -hmm. or, you know, teachers and, that right. your, and, and the yeah. teacher. Yeah. And that was your experience. And so that's what you emulated if you wanted to move up. Healthcare first. Yeah. But I, I want to, I, we're going to. That was the Title 20 program that came out of the federal government when they uh, decided that they needed more Puerto Ricans to go into social work. I'm a product of that. Okay. Title 20, Fordham University. So, yeah, that's what happened because the reality is the number of social works in New York City was like this. And right. so they had to come up with something. And they, that's what the federal government came out with the Title 20. But you got to talk about the young lords and what effort they made to increase our awareness. Because prior to that, I mean, we were like being kicked out of the Bronx, the, burning the Bronx down, remember? And they're making the impossible possible. Remember that? It just came out. Right. So there was a lot of things that were happening to us all over the place. The fact that we're still here shows you how strong that we are, because the reality is we've been beat up by everybody, even the island. How many people went on the island? The Dutch, the Spaniards, the English, the Amer I mean, the fact that we're still here and still chugging along, unfortunately, the, the older generation, that first group, it's starting to die out. You see with the, all the, the music, people that have died, you know, Tito Puente, you name it. So you see that that now is, is changing. Right. So now unless this group of Latino Puerto Ricans pick it up, it's gonna be a lot lost. That's the reality of the situation. Thank you. I, I, I wanna go back to, I've heard sort of rumbling here every time the word immigrant gets mentioned. Uh, and so we're in a safe space, right? Uh, so I, I, I want to get your sense of why that term is so troubling from the perspective of people who study or write about or live the experience of being being Puerto Rican. And, and I'll just share an anecdote again from this um, Sonia Songer Lee book, where in the 1950s, there were concerns in the O'Dwyer administration, I believe, about Puerto Ricans coming into the city and being overrepresented on welfare rolls. And the O'Dwyer administration pushes back on this and says, this is, this is not gonna be the case. We will not have this problem. And there was one uh, official from the administration who, described Puerto Ricans as the last immigrants to come to New York. I, I had the exact same reaction that you just had. I read this and I thought to myself, what does that mean exactly? That he was uneducated. Well, 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 there's, well, there's that. But he actually, I, I think what, you know, his sense was that 
Puerto Ricans were going to follow, to Laird's point, the traditional pattern of coming into the city, making, you know, going to public school, getting an education, and, you know, climbing the, the ladder of social mobility. Um, it, it stuck with me, this notion of the last immigrant, but the fact that they referred to them as immigrants was, was even more shocking. So, Anyway, I'm going to step back from this conversation and ask you all to tell me what the challenge is with, with the use I'm of this terminology. To you from the unacademic perspective. Oh boy. Okay. okay. <laughs> when I think of 1917, I think of World War I, and I think of the high cost that our citizenship gave. So, when I start thinking, I, I have an immigrant experience in all poor people who migrate someplace else at, whether it's Syrians to, to Greek, it doesn't matter, right. right? So that is an immigrant experience. But when I think of the cost of that citizenship, mm -hmm. when I think of the colonialism that has then followed that citizenship, to call me an immigrant, I'd rather you call me a second-class citizen because I paid, my family, my, my, the men in all of our lives paid too much for that, for us to be classified as immigrant. We paid a very heavy, heavy price for that citizenship. So that's the unacademic. Yes, no, no, that's good. And, I think uh, and, and that to me is, don't, put, don't ever underestimate that title that I got called U.S. citizen, it okay. cost me a lot. And I think it also speaks to um, a lack of any sort of useful language or nomenclature for this whole colonialism project, not just for Puerto Rico, but for other U.S. territories and other colonial subjects around the globe. Um, I've had those conversations with my own friends and peers in the diaspora over the last however many years I've been here. And I go into that phrase that you mentioned, Lorraine, quite a lot. And I hear my friends say it, and I always, it, it just makes my heart stop about the culture, being like culturally immigrant. Mm -hmm. And I see it's, that's a term that's coming from a good place. But as you said, it not only recognizes the price that Puerto Ricans paid for US citizen, if, that US citizenship that was imposed on us in 1917, but it also neglects the price that actual immigrants pay to actually arrive in this country and become citizens you know the fact of the matter is we can face all the discrimination we want we don't have to worry about visas we don't have to worry about going to the airport or traveling out of the country and then not being welcomed back we don't have to worry about any of those things and so again the lack of any clear or useful term i think leads to this confusion and like crisis of self me personally i've landed on using the term foreigner to describe myself because i think that in many ways i feel like a foreigner english is not my first language i learned it watching blues clues and barney and friends on cable television in puerto rico in the 90s um and then for, had formal english education in in school all the way through through college but this is still a foreign land for me and, and for many other puerto ricans who end up here um and yeah, that's just like the term that I have personally landed on whenever I, you know, am forced to explain how I feel. And uh, I personally always kind of like resist the cultural immigrant or just the immigrant label period just on those terms. But curious, Jenny Mard, what you think too? <laughs> well, when when you when you said you described yourself as foreign, I was thinking in a domestic yes, sense. Yes. <laughs> you know? the same thing. Um, so that one time, and we have a decolonization study group uh, going on at Centro now, and one of the first you know things that we're tackling is our lack of language, and so for. Um, for describing these things, right? And so part of the goal, one of the goals of it is to create new, what I describe as new conceptual pathways, you know, because language and concepts, you know, they open up imagination, they also close imagination. And that's that's my, uh, why I'm so insistent on not describing us as immigrants. I mean, first off, obviously there's no like nerdy, well, we're actually, we're not immigrants, you know, there's that part of it, but, but it's also, 
to me, it, it silences our history, going back to Trio and, and the importance of silencing, it silences US imperialism as well. I, I think it lets the US off the hook. And so that's one of my constant insistences that we need to talk not just about the what's happening, U.S. I mean Puerto Ricans experience of colonialism but also U.S. experiences and interest and investment and profit from colonialism and imperialism and that's always whenever ever I hear a U.S. politician saying oh I support self-determination for Puerto Ricans whatever they want that's not what I want to hear from you I want to hear what's your stance on the U.S. having colonies do you think it's okay for the U.S. to have colonies you know and so and how take a position on that you know so to me um, that's a silencing and that's my concern um, also with the lumping in of Puerto Ricans with other ethnic groups right as if you know we didn't have that that history that is somewhat particular not at all disconnected from um, the experience of Native Americans in the U.S. African Americans in the U.S. I, I think those are important groups for us to be after 1848 right? yeah, yeah, yeah for, for sure. those are important groups for us to be thought in relationship to mm -hmm. I think we're always grouped into you know Latinos in in, in a way that um, is not entirely useful, even though, you know, the experience of a lot of immigrants, Latino immigrants to the U.S. is driven also by U.S. empire and, you know, what U.S. foreign policy has done in Latin America. But to me, that's still very, you know, I, my feeling, my like, my emotional reaction, like your reaction about the, the cost of our citizenship, what I feel is that we don't have a country, you know, that other immigrants, they have a country, even if they've been pushed out of it through war, through economic policy, the desire to move here, you know, and there's a difference why there's a, there's a distinction made always between immigrants and expats, right? Like it, 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 expats, it feels more a, a choice, right? Like you've decided to carry out a life in a different country, uh, but immigrants have to migrate for some reason or other, you know, and we have now, we're thinking about climate migrants, we think about all these, all these terms around immigration always through a kind of forced, um, you know, context. Um, so we do have some of those experiences as Puerto Ricans, but I think um, to call us immigrant just erases our colonial experience that I think is something we feel every day because we don't have that country, that right. motherland in the same way. And in some ways, um, like I've experienced with undergrads that I teach, that sometimes they feel ashamed to be from Puerto Rico. They feel ashamed to be from a from a colony. You know, they can't have that same kind of national glorious history. You know, because we don't have our wars of independence. We, th th it's all been kind of also written in a particular way because we there's lots of moments of resistance that we could celebrate and be proud of. We have a history of political struggle that we should be very proud about. But I know that a lot of undergrads, when they walk into my classroom, not when they walk out, but when they walk in, <laughs> right. um, they arrive with uh, feeling some kind of way <laughs> about, about that political history. Let, let me, we're, we're running towards the end of the session. I, I just wanted to see if there were any other questions from the audience, any comments? Yes, Andrena. I had a comment. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. um, going back to the idea of, stories you know what is what are these numbers and this discussion what are what story that are they telling i'm also wondering what story is it telling about new york right not just about puerto ricans in new york but about new york as a city it seems like we're past the anti-gentrification and we're just uh kind of accepting that this is a hard city to live in and survival of the fittest you know like this is what's happening and I think you know maybe this is something that we should think more about like what is this telling us about New York as a place where you can remain or are constantly being pushed out of right yeah absolutely yeah there are um eight million stories right uh and that's a big one right how do we how do we talk about a city that's unaffordable yeah um, and that's that's where the policy question right. comes in right like so okay so we see these numbers so what are we going to do about it you know what is it that that needs to be done and you know and and that's why i'm, I'm not sure you know uh we didn't we'd need to you know go in that's a another conversation i was about to say right? we're gonna have yeah. to come back at yeah. the spring semester and and do this again yeah. uh any other questions or observations or comments from the audience Sure. I, I want to put Carlos on the spot. Okay. What do you what What's your reaction to Puerto Ricans as the last immigrants? Oh boy. 
<laughs> it wasn't my quote, by the way. I, I just want, uh, I want to be clear about that. Well, provocation, <laughs> though. It's a good provocation. First of all, it is incorrect. Right. It's, uh, but I think it's also, it talks about the mentality that uh, these are uh, elected or uh, appointed officials who's, in whose mind still pervaded the policy of 1921, 1924 that closed the doors on immigration, particularly European immigration, after they had already shut off Asian immigration. Right. So if they saw Puerto Ricans and immigrants, they said, well, you know, I guess we have to take those folks in. Um, so, yeah, I mean, are Puerto Rican immigrants? No, Puerto Ricans are not immigrants. Do we cross cultural borders? Absolutely. Do we cross political borders? Absolutely. But nevertheless, we are not immigrants, we're migrants. And are there remittances too, right? I mean, there are Puerto Ricans who are working here who are sending money back, back home, obviously not at the scale of Mexicans or Dominicans um, or other groups, but certainly important. Um, any final thoughts? Uh, I'm getting the John Endit uh, signal from, uh, from Andrena. Um, you guys were wonderful. Thank you for, for coming and joining us and talking to us about this report. Laird, congratulations, uh, another provocative, um, uh, piece of research as always. Um, thanks everybody. Thank you for thank you for coming. Very appreciated.